Hello and welcome back to Starting Conversations. I'm Bethany Tabor and this program is brought to you by the New Mexico Humanities Council. This session is a part of our newest Starting Conversations series on community archiving. During this series, we will be exploring the practice of archiving and expanding our understanding of what archiving is and what it means. Many of us are familiar with the academic approach to archiving, which is cataloging and organizing information to be housed in one place, like a library typically, but community archiving is an approach that maybe sounds new, but actually goes much deeper in human history. Traditions and culture ways have been preserved through communal efforts to pass down information from generation to generation, but we'll dive into that in a bit. This series is highlighting the Manitas Community Memory Project, which is a digital community-based archive that is facilitated and organized by the New Mexico Highlands University Department of Media Arts and Technology. Today's session is facilitated by Shane Flores with guests Dr. Tricia Martinez and Dr. Eric Romero. Conceptual artist and interdisciplinary culture worker, Mr. Flores is community facilitator for the Manitas Community Memory Project and is the principal at Studio Wet Future, developing history and culture-based content for cultural institutions, including the Bradbury Science Museum, the City of Las Vegas Museum, New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs, and UNM Maxwell Museum of Anthropology. He holds a BFA in Media Arts from New Mexico Highlands University in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Dr. Martinez, heir to the Arroyo Hondo Arriba land grant, is a PhD graduate in American Studies from the University of New Mexico. Her dissertation, entitled Living the Manito Trail, Maintaining Self, Culture, and Community, is an interdisciplinary ethnographic study that relies heavily on oral histories she collected from Manito communities who migrated from northern New Mexico to Wyoming. Currently, Tricia is a postdoctoral fellow at UNM Taos, teaching Chicana and Chicano Studies, serving as the program coordinator and working with Northern New Mexico high school students and the dual credit program. She is also serving as a visiting assistant professor for the University of Wyoming's School of Culture, Gender and Social Justice Latinx Studies program. Through teaching and community outreach, she is excited to help inspire the youth and create opportunities that serve in the best interests of our community. Dr. Romero is the interim chair of the Department of Languages and Culture at New Mexico Highlands University the Vice Chair of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Advisory Council, Senior Associate at the Center for the Study and Education of Diverse Populations, and the Interim Director at the Center for the Study of Northern New Mexico and the Greater Southwest. His research interests include Chicano ethnic identity formation, Southwestern sociolinguistics, heritage language revitalization, Hispanic land grant and Ezequia communities, immigration, US-Mexico relations and border, Becas Para Azatlan program history, placemaking and rural land use behaviors, Native American and Mezistaje traditions. Thank you so much for being here. And Shane, I will let you take it from here. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Bethany. And, uh, um, and I also appreciate the Humanities Council doing this series. It's nice to be able to have these kind of dialogues. Um, so the main, I, I, I before we get into the, the conversation, I wanted to sort of give a little bit of background context to the Menidos project, just because both doctors Romero and Martinez work with us on, on the project. And so I thought it might be helpful to have a little bit of context for that. Uh, the main focus of the Menidos Community Memory Project is the creation of a digital community archive for Manitos culture uh, and history. Um, this archive, uh, is intended to serve the dual purpose of both preserving a digital record of cultural continuity, which means, of course, photos, documents, audiovisual recordings, and digital records of objects, but also by providing access to this cultural record, or as our project director, uh, Dr. Esteban Real Gavez puts it, a place for the Menidos people to see themselves. Uh, this phrase itself reveals something inherent about conventional archives, as you kind of alluded to, Bethany, uh, which is that they've not done a very good job of uh, recording or providing access to marginalized communities, uh, which is something that this archive aims to remedy. Um, just a brief moment to address the most common questions whenever you mention the Menidos archive, a couple of things inevitably kind of come up and I think it'd be helpful to contextualize those things. The first is the term Manito itself. Uh, this is probably, I think, something that our uh, esteemed Manito sc scholars on this panel can address better later than I can, but like sort of the dinner party answer I've come up with is that 
It's kind of a self-applied identity within the land-based culture that em emerged in the mountains of Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado during the Spanish colonial land grant period. And it's shaped by the dynamics of the land grants, both private community and Pueblo. And as Dr. Martinez can speak to later, the diaspora of those communities now out into the rest of the country and the world. Uh, the second, and you kind of actually spoke very well about it in the preamble is what is a community archive? And as far as this particular community archive, there's so many shapes to it, what a community archive is. It's kind of a, is a, has a wide variety of interpretations. I feel like it's easier to speak to two eureka moments that led to the creation of the Menitos Project. One is the observations that Dr. Rael Galvez had of watching uh, Facebook groups happen uh, in relation to specific Menitos communities. They have Facebook groups. And what typically happens is somebody posts a picture and then there's threads, sometimes hundreds of thousands of comments with everybody kind of adding a piece to the puzzle of what that image has, whether it's the people in it or other context stories and memories about it. The other is a similar story which happened at a workshop in Taos that was for another project that was going to involve FSA photographs. And somebody brought out a photograph at that. And the way that the dynamic of when that photograph was brought out changed the whole room. And very rapidly, people started to also kind of be around this photo and started trying to work out the mysteries of the photo, the, the information, pre-existing information was terrible and it became kind of a problem solving session. So those kind of things are what this archive sort of the genesis of what it aimed to do and what it was. So, um, you know, uh, to close this sort of preamble, um, the Menudo's Community Project would like to replicate and enhance these community dynamics and, and build the archive as a community-centered endeavor so that the Menudo's can not only see themselves on their terms, but also have access to these cultural resources to kind of activate and energize their own projects and ideas or simply explore their own path through their heritage, I guess you could say. And to that end, Menudo scholars and scholarship is an important aspect uh, of the Menudo's Community Project. So, um, now I, I, that's, I'm done with that sort of thing. And uh, I want to, I want to, you know, uh, now move more over to the conversation. And I'd like to start sort of by, by, um, just asking a question of each of the two panelists sort of individually, individually. And I'd like to, uh, start with you, Dr. Martinez. Um, uh, so how would you say your, uh, academic journey has coincided with your ancestry and family heritage. Like, what what do you what what do you say is that relationship? Thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, so, what became my dissertation project and a continued area of research and community collaboration is exploring and documenting the migration experiences of Manitos from northern New Mexico. Uh, this is a part of my family history. My family began migrating outside of New Mexico for employment opportunities in the early 1900s, working the sugar beet fields and as sheep herders in Wyoming. I am a product of the Manito Trail, and I was born in a couple generations down the line um, in Cheyenne. Um, so with all that said, being able to connect to the um, archive itself through personal experiences has been um, really influential, um, not only on my academic journey, um, but also in the, the work that I, I produce. Sorry, muted, sorry about that. Um, and, and before we jump into the sort of uh, more general things, Dr. Romero, uh, you yourself, um, you know, Clearly from your, from your biography, you have a specific kind of intersectionality at play in regards to your approach to Menito scholarship. Uh, you know, you have this, what I would call a dance between pedagogy and lived knowledge, or as you and I've talked about, you know, your knowledge or the way you approach knowledge is not how knowledge sits in place, but how it lives in the hands. So given that and, and this sort of intersectionality, can you talk a little bit about that in relation to your, your work and how you approach it? Thank you. And again, appreciation for the sponsorship of, of this forum, the, this discussion. I, I, I think we need so many more of them as well and, and to make them available. And I, I, I think that's a, a key 
discussion is to speak about practicality and accessibility. Uh, similar to Dr. Martinez, um, my own academic trajectory has brought me back and, and even solidified more of this orientation that, that, you know, a phenomenology of place, a phenomenology of understanding where, where cognition and learning and knowledge is at, helps us to recognize that we as academicians are inserted within our work that, you know, that we don't just replicate the canon that, you know, academics isn't just a reiteration of other people's ideas, but it's this cognitive dance, as, as, as Shane mentioned, of this negotiation, which is saying we, we have knowledge as presented and historically academic knowledge has been presented as external, inaccessible or, or um, to some degree, the, 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 access, the access for the privileged. And so we need to kind of change around this idea of saying knowledge is, is general, knowledge is contextualized, knowledge is, is constructed and socially constructed. And so my, my own path in this is in alignment with many academic traditions that within the last 30 or 40 years have come to this recognition of understanding, you know, the nature of knowledge and the nature of learning and sharing as a construction rather and an interpretation rather than this, this bottle of knowledge, these gems of wisdom that we share with our students, but rather it's, it, it's, it's an activity. Uh, education isn't a, isn't a quantity or of content, but actually it's, it's an action and it's a verb. And I think, you know, to the degree that academic knowledge informs pedagogy, informs practice, is is a tradition that's gaining more and more strength but we we could see that many of our our institutions of higher education are very traditional in that sense of understanding that that knowledge is to be doled out to be distributed by by professors and by institutions and particularly our libraries and museums and so that uh, again these transitions in place which you're saying that you know uh, knowledge is public, knowledge is to be shared, knowledge is to be, uh, uh, should be inclusive of other people's ideas, etc. So I'm glad to be part of this trajectory. And at the same time, there's a personal benefit because within my own trajectory, I, uh, my, my academic background is social, cultural, linguistic anthropology. And so it, it provided me with venue of understanding much larger communities and to understand have a, a perspective on, on understanding better the, the world and cultural patterns within the world. But at the same time, it was a self-reflection because the, as much as I had the opportunity to study as an example, indigenous populations in Mexico, which was part of my academic training, there it, it kicked back or it, it was the mirror image of, you know, how we, we learn about other cultures at the same time that we're learning our own. And so I feel privileged and, 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 and strengthened with this dynamic that Manito's archiving project and, and community archiving in general is allowing us to be academicians in a big cosmopolitan academic world, but at the same time use our personal experience and insert it within research and insert it within our practice so that we, we become part of academia. We're not just reflecting and, and reiterating but that process of creating knowledge that we're inserted in as, as human subjectivities, as, as, as livid participants in helping our communities to recognize the value of their knowledge and to find mechanisms for sharing in a, in a prideful, uh, sustained manner. And, and I, I see that as being the shift that's taking place with many of our institutions being more involved with the engaged scholarship public history, uh, inclusive types of discourses. So I'm, I'm so glad that I get to be a part of it as well. Great, uh, thank, thank you. And, and um, kind of in relation to that um, and sort of you know, shifting to the archives and maybe perhaps through the, the lens of the Menidos archive um, and uh, again, returning or starting with yourself, Dr. Martinez, um, you know, and, and, you know, feel free to, to talk to each other rather than me as well. But um, uh, so as a scholar, right, or as scholars, um, 
what do you see as the relationship between your your academic praxis and 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 the traditional archive like the you know what has been before like these more institutional archives like what what do you you know what what yeah what is that relationship sorry i don't know where i was going with that but yeah well, traditionally, um, a lot of the archives I have found um, in my own field of study of this criminal justice and American studies, like traditionally, they're kind of dominant in patriarchal, white, heteronormative narratives and perspectives. Um, my own personal academic journey in American studies allowed for me to draw upon the field work of Chicana and Chicano studies, which um, really centered the narratives of those who are often marginalized. And so with that said, um, it has um, not only been an opportunity to reach and meet my own individual goals in terms of my academic, um, my, yeah, like my academic goals, but um, also to fulfill community aspirations and achieve efforts towards social justice. Um, sort of a brief follow Follow up before um, I sort of ask you the same question, Dr. Romero. It, it, with traditional archives, um, and this is sort of a, a, I guess, a particular nuance, perhaps. Did you find that you generally tended a need to go physically to those archives, or, you know, did you primarily explore them uh, digitally? And did you find that that was actually facilitated or an obstacle within the traditional archive? Well, as a first generation college student, a lot of the, the research um, skill sets, I, I didn't know much, but I went to the campus and I just started to learn, right? And so a lot of it was foreign to me. Um, they were in person archives um, and it was a matter of just kind of, you know, seeking help and, and guidance from those working in the archives. But uh, it was a learning experience and a learning curve for me for sure. Um, however, what I did come across was, you know, um, well, in, well, I guess once I, I recognized the value of um, like my area of focus and what I was trying to do with my research, I was able to kind of uh, narrow in, in particular areas. And, and so, um, and I don't know if we'll have a chance to talk about that later, but I, I've had the opportunity to come across materials that um, did highlight the, the voices and experiences of my ancestors, right? But they were reflected on um, in a, a marginalized way. Mm. Okay, thank you. And, and yeah, so Dr. Romero, kind of the same. What is the relationship between your academic praxis and the traditional archive? Well, I, I, I brought the traditional archives to my office. Um, you know, I, I, I'm a book person, you know, I, I, I really do appreciate the, the opportunity to sit down and work through a book. I'm still folding myself into digital and screen based uh, um, access to literature and material, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I've, I've always appreciated having access to the shelves. There's, there's a solace in the library. There's a, a repose and, and, and certainly that flexibility of of not looking at a singular volume, but what's next to it? What, what's a shelf below, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, in, in a very positive sense, I, I, I appreciated the amount of resourcing that's made available in the traditional archives. However, part of my, my own personal trajectory is again, similar to Dr. Martinez, I'm first in family. So I didn't really have that mentoring as to you know how to how to pr proceed with with creating academic knowledge. So you know when I my BA is from the University of Colorado in Boulder, a big institution, an alienating institution. If you didn't have some support of some mechanisms of support or or community, so for me there was a difficulty in in looking for information. You know the 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 hundreds of thousands of volumes that are in university are inaccessible if you don't know the search procedures and the protocols of being able to identify specific information once you've narrowed down and you're, you're looking for something specifically. So it could be very alienating, very, very limiting in scope if you don't have search criteria or, or understanding you know, what those, uh, those tools are at. But again, so on one sense, having access to materials that, that are visual 
beautiful experience. But at the same time, when you're looking for something specific, you, you there was somewhat of a difficulty in, in finding through it. And so to the degree that we're working not only in a digital sense, but really endeavoring to make these materials available to a much larger public uh, as public historians or public scholars are doing, uh, I, I think we th making it available is a great step, but we really, really have to work at that community level to make sure that people are comfortable getting past those initial stages of, again, what are, what are seemingly barriers of, of the institutions and barriers of academia, that you need a certain kind of academic pedigree or, or some kind of knowledge of knowledge in place so as to be able to get into there and, and, and start playing around with shelves and digital archives, et cetera. So that, that's a big challenge for us. You know, we have to change around community perception of where that are, what is community archiving? And again, the idea of public knowledge and, and, and community engagement in the generation of knowledge. I'd like to even add just the, the significance of mentorship, right? Like we have some amazing mentors, um, the generation above me. And, you know, once I, I made my way into the academic setting, like I've been blessed by um, researchers, scholars, professors who have been able to pour into me and, and help me realize the potential of, of the research that I want to conduct and, and, and pass on the, their knowledge and um, skill sets, right? And, and that has really been influential in, in my journey. And, and even just thinking of the, the effort and the labor that went into creating um, the Manito Community um, Archive, right? And, and we, it's, it's very um, laborious. And, and um, but, you know, I, I thank God for the opportunity to be able to um, produce knowledge that can inspire the next generation. So, uh, so following a little on this thread, um, and uh, let's go ahead and, and stick with you because you're on a roll here, Dr. Martinez, I think towards this thought, I think it segues nicely, I think, into the next sort of uh, question. Um, and, and you're right, I mean, one of the interesting things is, you know, before you start creating a community archive, mm -hmm. it seems rather straightforward. And then you find out there's a bunch of different uh, mechanics and dynamics, uh, not not physical dynamics or 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 uh, um, structural dynamics, but system systemic dynamics that go into the building of an archive. Anyway, I digress a little bit, but um, I think that that's that's kind of the subject of the or the 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 core of the next subject, which is how is that different? You know, your your experience with the traditional archive, how is that different in how you see? A community archive, in particular the Menidos community archive. I guess, in a sense, the question really is like, with your experience as a scholar and your experience with the traditional archive, what is it that you want to see different in a community archive? How does it help your work better? To uh, uh, what would it need to do to make your work better and easier and more in depth? Yeah. So one of the, the strengths of community archives um, that I have found have been the use of oral histories and primary materials that are reflective of the lives of the people themselves. Um, and oral histories are important to consider when you examine and engage any particular topic or area of research, um, but in particularly um, in relation to marginalized communities, um, the words of the people themselves um, are our best references for insight and understanding. Personal narratives of experience, the good, the bad, the in-between are essential in creating this well-rounded account. Um, and then the ability of an individual for, to reflect upon those lived experiences also provides like this amazing and unique lens of analysis. Do you have any thoughts really quick before we uh, pivot to you, Dr. Romero, of like that last part that you just said, really, right? So there's these oral histories now. What do you see as something the community archive can do to help facilitate that kind of engagement that you just mentioned? Yeah. Is there um, any? Well, you I don't have to have one, but if you had any thoughts about that, like what would make that better? Yeah. Well, I think again, it kind of connects back to that role of mentorship and then um, being able to connect with, 
with students right now. I'm working with two interns who will be conducting oral history research um, to not only gain insight from their elders on the experiences that they lived, but then we're going to be able to put that back into the, um, the archive, right, so that they can um, so that others can learn and, and get a, a, a rich understanding of the um, money to lived experiences. So um, did that answer your question? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, no, okay, that cool. was. I know so my I, question was kind of confusing, but you, you, like, you cut through the, to the clarity of it. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Dr. Romero, yourself, um, how do you see, based on your experience with a traditional archive of how you see community archives as different and how you want them to be different. I, I, I think one of the key concepts or the, you know, for sponsorship for another level discussion is this idea of authority. Because traditionally, you know, when we think about traditional archives, there's, there's an allusion to the authority of the author that's presenting the information. It's a PhD or uh, some kind of recognized scholar that that does publication and, and gets their materials to be afforded on a shelf or, or on, on some kind of other format, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, the community archiving shifts a little bit more the focus. And, and I come out of a tradition that's notorious for appropriating knowledge. You know, I, I go do, you know, the, the eth historically ethno anth Ethnogra anth anthropological ethnography is we go into communities, we extract knowledge, and then we present it that we're authorities in how to do this. Of course, you know, that, that shifted significantly within the last few decades, et cetera, et cetera. And more so, I, I think earlier you used the word facilitation. I think that's kind of the idea of an academician working with, with community archiving. We're facilitating for these alternative voices and these these counter narratives to be available, and and again that's part of the challenges for my you know my uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Several years ago, in one of the classes, we had a student that identified that he had a grandmother that had twenty three children, and I'm saying, wow, we we, we you know for posterity, we really got to recognize who this individual is. That person should be on a coin or have a a plaque or something um, and, 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 and to do those kind of recognitions and a lend authority to the, again, the living knowledge that we continue to speak about, et cetera. So community archiving gets, allows us to shift where authorship and authority is and use it as a community promotion, as a, an empowerment, as a um, cultural identity sponsor within our communities and bring it back. But then it, 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 it gives us the challenge as professionals, as academicians, how do we transfer that information, not only in making it accessible, but bringing it to the level that this is also knowledge and this is also a, a engaged scholarship. So it's up there at the level of our, our classic authors. And so again, the, this idea of understanding where is counter narrative, where's authority, where is knowledge, and making it not only that it's inserted within the institutions of, that have historically been limiting of those voices, but bring it at the level of saying, this is also very much academic material, and this is, this is what we have to recognize as authori authority of knowledge. I'd also like to add just the agency and sense of empowerment that's, um, that the inner or my grandmother is able to tap into when she is, you know, sitting at the table and being recorded just to tell her her stories. Um, it, it, it's really empowering on all levels, like for her, for me, for our family, like they get really excited just to know like, wow, look, look, here's a, another article and telling our story, right? Like they, they never thought that their stories really mattered, right? It was a, a journey of sacrifice and hard living and, and you know, a lot of marginalized experiences. And now they get to, they get to um, be centered. Their experiences are centered in a very beautiful way. And, and I think there's appropriate, if I could lend to Dr. Martinez's comment, right now, the, the idea that a lot of people the, with the, the accessibility of, 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 of uh, genealogy, uh, uh, genealogy, biological histories, right? 
that you know people are doing DNA testing and figuring out, look at my blood quantum, et cetera, et cetera. And they want to add story to that, right? So so to some degree, we've we've been stifled or limited in in sharing that knowledge. And now with the profusion of people doing genealogy testing or 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 genetic testing, et cetera, this is right in line that we could put meat to it and say, well, don't just look at your blood quantum and you know where your mixers are at. Really going looking at those family histories and, and the migration histories, the wonderful histories that could be attached to it. And I see community archiving running parallel to that sort of movement of people really looking at ancestry, but having a story that goes along with it and not just a percentage point of you know who they are and where they should uh, locate their identity markers. So, Tricia, can you um, elaborate a little bit on specifically how these issues of memory gathering, um, in field work, oral histories, and stories actually feature kind of more specifically in your work with diaspora? Like, like how do how is that different, and and what are the complications in in dealing with with diasporic communities? Oh, okay. Um... So just kind of connecting it to my own family, uh, my grandmother is the one who has carried on many of our traditions and practices, including the art of storytelling. And so during my graduate studies at the University of New Mexico, um, as part of my research for the Following the Monifo Trail project team, I've come, I came across some of the oral histories that my grandma recorded, which I did not know, right? And that she had even recorded these. And so here she is telling our family stories and experiences um, and then as I continued with research, I ended up coming across some more oral histories of my great grandmother um, recorded in 1982 as part of the La Cultura oral history um, project that was um, archived over at the Wyoming State Archive. And this had the voice of my great grandmother as mentioned, my grandmother, my godmother, and then many other Manito families who migrated up to Wyoming. Um, so since then, around that time, like so inspired by all of this, we continue to document these histories through um, oral history. Um, do we documented these experiences through oral history, um, oral history interviews, and we probably collected over 60 recordings at this point in time. And then now as the Manito Migrations Manager for the Manito Community Memory Project, I've been able to further this research um, gathering Manito migration experiences. And I've also been blessed with the database to input all of this um, history so we can see the breadth of the Manito diaspora, right? And we can see across the diaspora a lot of similarities in terms of the reasons for migration, um, whether it be employment or family um, education in some cases. Um, and, and so I have to say to anyone listening, um, or watching this, if you have a money for migration experience that you would like to include as part of the uh, money for community memory project, please don't hesitate to reach out. Great. Um, and let me ask you just really quick, just because I think that you might have some particular insight into this, because it sounds like you're already doing it. Like, how do you see that, uh, especially in the context of diaspora? How does this digital archive uh, like, how do you see using it as a tool in, in facilitating um, your, you know, the project is how you are, are, are following it? Well, I think it's important to remember that the Manito communities of northern New Mexico, they, a lot of them did migrate out, right? A lot of migration took place in families and communities um, were established elsewhere. And so to have this type of archive that is digital, it's really important. So that way we have access to these primary materials, historic photographs, um, other documents that um, can really bring us all together, right? And um, so I think it's when we think of the Manito community and, and, and the diaspora, a digital archive uh, really does complement our history and our experiences. Oh, thank you. And and Professor Romero, uh, how about yourself in your in your work doing memory gathering and the field work that I know that you have done quite a bit? How do you um, can you talk a little bit about that and you know your approach to oral histories and maybe um, in addition to that maybe go a little bit into what you're doing with the Matanza and digital Matanza? But start with with how you've approached it more generally. 
Well, one, one, if I could build a little bit on, on what Dr. Martinez was mentioning, um, the idea that there, there's a therapeutic quality to being able to tell your story of diaspora or migration or other trauma-induced social memory. And, and I think to some degree, I've, I've dealt with a, a little bit of all of the above. Uh, again, myself coming from Southern Colorado, I'm very familiar with the, the, the family history, the family social memory as says, we were from New Mexico, we were land grant families, et cetera, et cetera. And for that matter, there, there's a sense of uh, despair, uh, a sense of, of significant loss as a repercussion and kind of an illusion of saying that, you know, we, we've lost a significant part of our culture because of the land loss. You know, we, we used to survive as land-based people. And however long ago that was, I think that's still very much in the social memory. Uh, part of my master's program, I did a, a origin destiny study. It was a migration study. I was dealing with Mexican in, in documented immigration, uh, migration. And so it, it, it was, again, a twofold level of ethnographic uh, research, one that I was studying the, the undocumented community up in Denver, Colorado, particularly some families that have found their way into the construction business and, and, and anchored themselves in certain aspects of the community up there. And then I followed those families or rather went and returned with them to the little communities in Chihuahua where they came from, Creel, Namikipa, Chihuahua, Chihuahua. And it, it's really interesting to see because again, you know, there's a, there, there's a, a trauma-induced history there as well that, you know, they had to leave their communities uh, with a position, with the potential of returning to it. So again, you, you, you know, my, migration is a very significant part of, of world history and again, to the degree that we recognize it isn't just the process of the origin destiny itself, but rather what are the repercussions of, of that sort of uh, transfer and, and, and shifting of culture, particularly when you're going to an area that is either uninviting or you're, you're, you're coming into communities where you may be more likely to be disenfranchised from all aspects of your social and, and your economic lifestyles. Uh, the other aspect is some of the work that we're, we've been doing, you know, now that I've been part of the high, uh, Highlands in looking at Manito land loss story, because again, there, there, there's a psychology, a social psychology that goes along with that and saying that we didn't have to relocate, but we lost the land from underneath our, our very being. And so again, not, you know, comparable to the diasporic uh, thought patterns, et cetera, et cetera. But there, there certainly is that significance of, of trauma-induced forced um, behavioral changes at the loss of land as opposed to having to leave the land itself. Um, I, and I think to some degree, um, that's again where it becomes a, thera a therapeutic exercise when we start allowing for those discussions to take place. And so to some degree where individuals or families or communities have held it internal to themselves in, 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 in understanding that there was land loss, there was migration, there was, was diasporic movement, having a venue or having an opportunity to share with others, I think that's gonna create a much, much larger community of sharing in the sense of saying, well, you, in, in, in fact, let me, let me share this. this, this is my, uh, a, a tangent, but it might be of interest. Uh, when you start looking at the terminology Manito, even though we introduced the, the discussion last time we met, you know, we, we spoke about that nomenclature, Nuevo Mexicano, Chicano, Manito, Mestizo, Genicero. It's very complicated. And, and one of the sources that I've used in the explanation of that nomenclature is to say that Manitos was a terminology that came out during World War II or during the beginning of the 19th, the, the 20th century, when Nuevo Mexicanos left their rural communities and found themselves in Denver, in Laramie, in Kansas City, in Salt Lake City. And one of the, ident the first identifications is, oh, you're from Peñasco, I'm from Ora. Orale manito, hermanito. And it could have been referenced to the, uh, 
the Penitente Brotherhood, or it could just be that there was an association. So there's there's different versions as to how it came about, or even during World War II that you know with the the inscription and the and of of mil, military personnel coming out of New Mexico when they found themselves meeting with somebody from an area similar to Southern Colorado, North Mexico, there was an immediate anchoring. There was there was an affinity already established. And therefore, the term of Manito came into place. So in an essence, it developed outside of the area. It wasn't an internal descriptor, but it was a descriptor that came from the outside and, and, and was used to recognize everybody here that even though, you know, we kind of think of a, a homogenous population here, once we go out into the big world and, and you know, again, particularly these other urban areas of the United States or, or, or areas of the world, it's nice to have that convenience, that convergence of being able to speak to somebody that knows your reality, understands your universe, comes from the same cultural backgrounds. So right now we have the Manito Digital Archives Project to be able to do that. And, and again, you know, like I say, you know, Kansas City, they're going to tie in. Chicago, they're going to tie in. Laramie, Wyoming, they're going to tie in. Denver's going to tie in. Salt Lake City is going to tie in. Walla Walla, Washington, they're going to tie in. Because that's where the different directions where people have went um, out of forced migration or out of, you know, economic design and necessity and such. So I think it's really opening up that level of discussion. I think everybody, we're going to be pleased to see the amount of sharing that's going to take place. And again, the, the potential therapeutic quality of, of bringing people together in, in, in space, in a digital space. And it's not unlike some of the fiestas activities, because again, the Las Vegas fiesta, the Taos fiestas, the Española fiestas, there's a designation is that they're cultural fiestas. But what it is, is it's a celebration of family coming back, Las Vegas in particular. You, you look around, you know, the plaza area when the fiestas are taking place. Most of the people that are there have traveled from the outside to come home to be part of a community celebration to catch up with family, to reinvest and, and reinvigorate close ties, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it serves as a process of community building, particularly for those that are not in the immediate community. So I see the digital archives is going that direction. Now, what we're framing from the university perspective is we wanna do a matanza and, and, re, and relate to this idea that the matanza as traditionally practiced in Northern New Mexico and Southern Colorado, was a, a cambalache, it was a, 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 a repartimento, it was a come together. Given that, you know, there was a slaughtering, a butching and, and food preparation and sharing, et cetera. But the whole idea is it was a celebration between families or within communities for people to come together and, and do a, a very significant sharing. So whether we're doing it by, by means of sharing food and bread and chicharron or doing it on the, by storytelling on, on the website, I think it's going to serve the similar kind of purpose of bringing people together in, in, with a cordiality and a mutual respect for one another. So I'm really looking forward to see how big this is going to get. And perhaps, you know, we're going to catch some of those manitas that are up in uh, Winnipeg, Canada, or, or maybe on the other side of the ocean that just want that anchoring. They don't get, they're going to be wanting us to send care packages of red chili and pinon. But I think initially they're going to want to be part of this ongoing discussion of storytelling and sharing. Um, great, fantastic. Um, I, I kind of want to, you touched on a, a couple of things, but one, one I kind of want to segue to, well, also, and regarding the, you know, fiestas in the plaza, I think it's interesting you talk about that. Right now there's a, an impulse and a movement by, you know, uh, people who have been bas basically agents of gentrification to push the fiestas out of the plaza. And that to me is a very, very significant thing happening that's very interesting. And it'll be, you, you know, interesting if the Manitos themselves can be sure and hold that place in the center of town and not have it pushed out to the sticks because that benefits uh, gentrifiers. Um, but the, what I wanted to segue to was. Um, uh, because you were speaking a little bit about it, and I'd actually like to hear both of your interpretations of this term and concept, and then, um, you know, tie it into 
tie it into what role that you see for something based on this concept in, in the digital archive, and that is cadencia. So Dr. Martinez, starting with you, what is your uh, definition of cadencia? How do you see that as, you know, what's the relationship between that and lived experience? And, and how do you see that um, in relation to something like the digital archive? So cadencia is a sense of belonging that can be inspired by identity, ties to place, experiences, and or similar interests. Throughout my journey, I have found it of utmost importance to generate um, cadencia in spaces where we feel we don't belong. So this is particularly reflective in the archival world, right, especially when we consider the, the significance of the Manito Community Memory Project's digital archive. So being able to like access um, content that connects lives and experiences um, is really a gift that not only continues to foster our own identity, our sense of belonging, but is an amazing resource that we can all draw upon to educate the next generations. Sorry, I muted. Uh, how about yourself, Dr. Romero? What is your what is your definition of cadencia, if it's indeed any different than Dr. Martinez's? And how do you how do you see you know that in relationship to lived experience and, and the archive? Well, one one I'm I, I'm going to give a bumper sticker, or if anything, at least an elevator speech. I, I wrote a dissertation around this, so you know, please, you know, on the on the next forum, give me three hours to explain my ideas. To on re, regarding cadencia, it, the the shortened version is is again there, there's a the phenomenology of lived experience, the anchoring the the cognitive anchoring that goes along with being part of a space, cadencia roughly translated in the most pedestrian level is place identity, your 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 sense of belonging to a landscape, to a community and and for that matter. There, there's a whole series of different kind of aspects as far as determining lived phenomena being part of a community. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us, we're still hunter-gatherers. We still go pick pinyon. We know where the Oshai is. We know where the Kota is. We know where, uh, where the mushrooms are high on the mountain, and we know how to calibrate uh, the, the time of year, the Cabanuelas approach as to when we understand this is the time of the year that you go for the harvest. That's, that's a, a stewardship idea. That's you know, a relationship that you're, you, you understand the timeliness of weather patterns, that you understand the physical nature of landscape and you're, you're in tune to it. And again, for many of us for, as land-based populations, we've historically shared that knowledge you know, when, when do you go scout for, for deer and elk? Uh, when do you start again determining early in the summer if there's going to be pinyon in what areas to look at? So again, part of it has to go with, you know, subsistence patterns, which are again, you know, strategies, food, food, prep, food gathering uh, strategies that have been passed on for a long time. The other one is that kind, that other relationship with wildlife and understanding and appreciate the animals that are that are surrounding us and, and and i'm going the real strong rural mountain serrano direction of saying you know many of our many of our communities historically have been based on living off the landscape going up high in the mountain for wood and and knowing where the proper clay soil is is in place to bring down to mix into your adobe and such so there's a lot of historical practice that are in place that either had been disrupted or in continuity, but it, it's a knowledge base that ties in very much as part of Querencia. So it isn't just my anchoring, my, 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 my attraction to the landscape. There's a knowledge base. There's a foundation of, of specific idiosyncratic knowledge that may, may be tied into it as well. And part of that is, of course, as it, every, every form of knowledge, requires some sort of sharing mechanism. And so as part of a sharing mechanism, that's where anecdote and story and, 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 and sharing, whether it be digital or whether it be sitting around 
a campfire or sitting, you know, on the res or lana in the afternoon, giving those stories. So for me, this storytelling, the narrative accounting is so very important because again, we, as educators, we know you really internalize and anchor a thought, a concept, an idea when you, when you're, you're giving, when you're sharing it, you, you learn something best by teaching it. You learn, you anchor something, internalize it better by sharing it. It may be an abstract concept. It may be an idea. Again, this, this anchoring, this, this identity, but when you start lending voice to it and lending narrative to it and using linguistic patterns that are part of your community. And for me, there's an importance there. We, we just don't speak about our landscape and our community and our heritage. We speak about it in a certain way. And that's part of the, the social linguistic understanding is how do you speak about place? How do you, how do you express Manito tradition value cultural and insight it is and, and a lot of the code switching goes on there's a structure to it it isn't haphazard it isn't serendipitous uh, lopsided there's an intentionality that goes along with the manner of how we speak and particularly how we speak of landscape and place and community and and the sierra and such and so to the degree that we we want to facilitate for those kind of linguistic sharings take place, whether it be story, whether it be a photographic essay, whether it be an art project, et cetera. There's so many different manners of expression, but it's gonna be a release of that cognitive ability of saying, this is what I know, this is what I wanna share, this is what I want to contribute to a larger discourse in dealing with a shared idea and such. It may be idiosyncratic. This is this is where I went and caught you know all these rainbow trout or, or, or this is where uh, well, we shared space with grandma when grandma went with us to cut wood, etc. There, there's some specific, specific stories that we tell, but in all it's really speaking about some bigger issues of, of the value system that goes along with Querencia. Querencia, again, is place identity and place stewardship is demonstrated by values of respect, collaboration, sharing, stewardship, environmentalism, those, those, those are the underlying virtues that we speak about when we're sharing stories. And I'm sure it's gonna show up very much with the digital archives that underline many of these stories. You're gonna see that re reinforcement and the reiteration of the value system that makes us part of this community, et cetera. That's the larger sharing. That's the larger knowledge that we that we share with one another. And, and I'm really looking forward to how it finds its way into digital because again, it, it it's nice when we're sitting around the, you know, the Resolana, but now we have another format that's going to be further reaching and, and, and far reaching in potential. So th this could get really big. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martinez, I'd like to ask you to sort of uh, nuance a little bit on that in regards to the diaspora, because, you know, thinking here about, um, you know, with this, this idea of play based right, and, and now we have bodies moving through space and being far from this place, both real and conceptual kind of thing. So how, how do you see Cadencia in relationship to diaspora? Like, what is that for you? And, and then maybe if you want to segue in your answer into sort of the next thing, which is what is that continuity of Cadencia in the digital, right? So I know that's a lot in there, but feel free to just go to town through the whole thing, right? So, yeah. No, it's a great question because just hearing Dr. Romero um, speak really inspires me and kind of like, man, this is why I do what I do. And this is why I was able to feel and build cadencia in academic spaces that I um, not only learned in, but also um, I'm able, I have the privilege of teaching in, right? Um, so currently I am here at the University of New Mexico. And when I was, well, well, um, well as a graduate student at the University of New Mexico, when I heard, you know, coming back, right? Cause I'm a product of the Manito Trail. So I was born in Wyoming, but I got to come back. I had the blessing of returning. And you could think of that like, man, like, I'm, you know, I wasn't really raised here. Now we spent summers here, but I wasn't, you know, compared to some of my cousins, it was a little, it was different. 
and but to join a project team that was interested in my story of migration and what we were doing up there and how it was all connected it was really inspiring and empowering for me so now i'm here and i'm teaching and i'm at and i'm teaching at the university of wyoming for latino studies and of course, I'm, as educators, you know, he like uh, Dr. Romero said, it's so important to teach it, to share it. And so I'm sharing my experience, my grandma's experience, and, and there's students that are just like me. And they're, they're like kind of confused about identity. I'm not this, I'm not that. I'm, you know, they're just trying to figure it out, but they know their families from Northern New Mexico. And so I'm introducing this material and they are just blown away and they go home and they, they tell these stories to their, they're sharing with their grandparents, right? And then their grandparents are again, telling them more and they're feeling validated in, in this, this whole knowledge based um, of, of place-based identity, right? Being able to like connect and to understand and to like really be a part of something that's much greater than themselves at this point right now, as we continue to expand the database and build up our stories and it's just it's a really cool um it's a really cool experience that i think is important um just based on like knowing oneself and then learning about others and, and establishing these relational solidarities um and when we have a greater understanding of ourselves and community it leads a to a greater sense of responsibility to really look out and care for and protect one another and what we hold sacred do you see that the digital space is able to bridge that distance and 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 uh, you know bring these students that you're talking about all the way in Wyoming? Like, are they getting an impression of the actual physical space in New Mexico, or do you think that that's a very difficult thing to achieve in the digital space? Um, I mean, there's no place like home, or at least being down here in northern New Mexico, right? But at the same time, like the same photos that I'm including in the digital archive, when they draw upon their grandmother's um, photos, they're like, this, they could be part of the same photo album, right? And then they have the narrative and the stories and they have the same smells in the kitchen and the same music. So like, I feel like the digital archive can translate. I mean, with today's modern age and, and digital technology, like, you know, we can, we can create a very solid um, experience for those that are out in the diaspora that really just bridge bridge the different communities. Right. And, and Dr. Romero, do you yourself have any thoughts, you know, around these words about continuity, the continuity of cadencia in the digital? But before I, I ask Bethany, if she has any questions, do you have any thoughts about that? I, about I actually have a question for you. Does virtual tourism work? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't. <laughs> to I don't try to, 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 yeah. To, to some degree, we're we're trying to create that, right? You know, if if we if we want to give this anchoring, this sensation of place, uh -huh. by means of story, you know, and 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 yeah, you don't get to smell the pinon, you don't get to touch the water, the cold water that I'm talking about, etc. But we're really trying hard to re to replicate to give story to how important these places are. And the real anchor is if somebody has a shared experience, that, that's obvious, right? Yeah, I, I've been to that lake. And yeah, I, I, you know, when we were picking piñon, we would eat the little pieces of trementina and get them stuck in the teeth. And you'd have to pick up a little stick to pull it out. And then you're having to pick out, you know, which are the vano piñon in this. If you've done that experience, you know exactly what a person is talking about. But for those that don't know, and, and perhaps they didn't get to share that story, and, and, and Dr. Martinez, again, you know, you know I, I appreciate your, you're coming home, right? You're, you're coming back and reliving some of the stories and some of the experience that have been within your, your, your family archive for the longest time. You've, you've heard these stories, you know these experiences, et cetera, and you're coming back to it. And myself, I'm trying to relive it as much as possible, you know, I, um, I, I was gone for a while as well. I, I was out of the country for six years and missed so very much being part of my the, the Sangre de Cristo, which was so significantly part of my upbringing and my knowledge base, etc. So, so the challenge for us is one, being accurate, authentic, and sharing to that, to that gut level so that people could really understand 
particularly those that have not shared that experience. And I think that's kind of the challenge to us as, as storytellers and as, as story, story sharers is to give it to one another in the manner that it's relatable, but also explanatory for those that don't have the same anchoring as our own. And that's where the idea, you know, I, you know, I, I'll watch YouTube videos of, of distant countries and it's beautiful, it's nice, but it's not the flavor, it's not the sensation, it's not the personal experience. It's an attraction and I'd like to go there. I wanna to go to Machu Picchu and, and, you know, look at the hydrology systems. In the meantime, it, it, the interest is there, the novelty is there but the essence, the real anchoring is not there. And, 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 and I, I think that's gonna be a challenge to us to the degree that we could capture it at that livid experience level, at that essential level where I, if you're talking about grandma drinking Alhusema lavender tea, that you hear that story and you, you, you never drank the tea, but man, you could imagine it. You could internalize it and, and let it become part of your ethos and, you, and, and your way of thinking, et cetera. That's the challenge for us at the level of sharing the level of storytelling that we wish to get invested in. Yeah, so think, I mean, thinking about your question, your challenge to me, I, I would say that I travel the world through uh, music, cinema, and food right? And less something like a, like a David Attenborough documentary. So to me, that would be it. Cinema, cinema, food, and music. So um, those are all the questions I had. Bethany, I, I, I'm sure you probably have maybe some questions here. Um, so can I turn it back over to you for now? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I just, uh, it was, it's such an enlightening question, uh, an enlightening discussion. Um, First, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Martinez and Dr. Romero um, for your generous insight and um, and commentary on your own experiences. And um, it's an interesting question that you posed, Dr. Romero, about does digital tourism work? And I sort of um, I sort of lean the same way as as Shane in talking about uh, sort of like immersive storytelling, like cinema um, or other using other uh, media to sort of tell the story of a place. I think about, um, I think about the sort of power of the, the tools of audio and how you can, um, if you can sort of capture different sounds or, or sound scores, soundscapes of a certain place that, that sort of helps to get at, um, at a particular flavor of a place. And I think that there are ways to immerse people um, <clears throat> through audio and through storytelling mixed with um, music and sounds of, a, of an environment, but, um, but it's really hard to fully anchor yourself in a place using just digital means. Um, but, but I don't think it's futile. And I, uh, I think that it's having a, having like a digital place or, or even just these resources, these archives housed on, on the web and allowing for people to, um, especially people in diasporic communities who know that they have come from a place, but their family has migrated. And so they're living in a different geographical location um, to be able to then at their fingertips kind of hear these stories, research and, and see these stories. That's, um, that's a really beautiful thing. And so I guess it's sort of this, a really delicate balance of being anchored in a place being physically in a place, experiencing something physical and in person, but then also being able to have access to information and, and stories, story ways. Um, but yeah, I think that it was just such a great conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciated it. And um, in the description of this video, there will be links to uh, the Manitos archive um, and additional links with other information. Uh, and with that, I will sign off. Thank you guys. Everyone.